नमस्ते गुड इवनिंग एंड नॉट श्योर इफ देर एनी गाइस फ्रॉम यूएस और जॉइन सो फॉर वेलकम टू दिस सेशन सेवन ऑफ दिस वेबिनार सीरीज माइंडफुलनेस ऑन द गो आई एम विनय दाभोलकर योर होस्ट फॉर दिस सेशन एंड विथ मी इज अश्विन पाटिल हाई अश्विन Um, Hi, hello everyone. Yeah, who is who is going to be a co-host for this um, session? And for me, this has been the toughest chapter in my workshops when I cover this topic. So um, I'm hoping that um, Ashwin is really going to be helping me out, and you all will help me as well. So the chapter today is searching for the real hero. let me introduce ashwin ashwin and i have been uh, knowing each other and uh, discussing this topics for the last couple of years ashwin and i used to live in the same apartment until very recently ashwin is engineer by training he has about 10 years experience in it out of which about 6 years in uk and couple of years in dubai after that um after coming back uh, to india and bangalore he started a company called dhyana which was in integrated well being space they had cafes and they had various programs like yoga and mindfulness and perhaps many more he did that for 2 years and interestingly for the past couple of years he's focused completely on what we could say self discovery or self inquiry mode i used to ping him call in sometimes and he used to say oh i'm in pondicherry in a retreat or he would say i'm in tiruvannamalai in another retreat and you know i i could find ashwin in all kinds of places um, in retreats in the past couple of years would that be correct ashwin yeah okay now um most recently he is experimenting in social impact space so i'm sure we'll have fun um talking to ashwin now let me um show a few slides um that will take us into this chapter this chapter actually perhaps carries the bias on my um scientific uh, readings that i do and we are trying to uh, minimize that uh, bias as much as possible as we introduce these okay so i'm going to share my my screen now okay um i guess most of you would be familiar uh, with this by now we have been saying this is roughly our working definition of mindfulness which is a process of learning to see clearly despite fast automatic and biased thinking any time anywhere uh last two chapters we have been using a metaphor of math and in chapter 5 we asked a question is a part of the map frozen which means the map we look at the world through a map and uh, is a part of that map frozen which is i i just refuse to change that part of the map in chapter 6 we asked the question how do i look like in the map and we use the term self image in the chapter and in fact we said that behind every sustained negative emotion there is a damage potential or perceived damage to the self image now in this chapter we explore the question just to take the map analogy forward how to improve my map image um let me see there's a, something on the chat window okay all right suddenly okay okay 
Minal and Vivek are here from US. Okay, good morning, guys. So the chapter yeah. begins with um, a comic scene from this movie, Amar Akbar Anthony, where this guy, Anthony Gonsalves, um, the, one of the heroes in the movie, he's drunk and he's got badly beaten up. He, he got into a fight. He's uh, a liquor dealer. And uh, he's come, he comes back from this fight and he's standing in front of a mirror. And he tells himself, see, I told you don't drink so many times. He's telling his image in the mirror, but you just don't listen. And this, look what happens to you. But don't worry now, I will put, apply medicine for your bruises. And what is shown in this picture is that he is trying to uh, make sure that the other guy doesn't move, that his image doesn't move, he's, he's holding tight. And with the other hand, he's trying to apply medicine. And he says, don't move, I'll put medicine. Yeah, that's, that's what it, this particular thing signifies. Now, what is the significance of this? Um, now, this, is, this may appear to be um, a strange proposal or hypothesis. And that's really what we want to explore. And I hope uh, you will question this, is that act of self-improvement, something we do all the time, is as meaningless as Anthony's act of putting medicine on the mirror. Yeah, why is this act uh, meaningless as far as Anthony is concerned? Because putting something on the mirror doesn't change um, anything to Anthony. Of course, if he puts the medicine on his body, uh, that would definitely, um, at least to his bruises, it may help. But uh, putting on the mirror is not, uh, not at all helpful or meaningless actually. Now this is what we want to really explore. I mean, how could this be? How could, I mean, I have improved. All of us would have experienced improvements. We, we decide to start a fitness program. We decide to start uh, a dieting program and they have their effects. So we improve. Why do we say this? And this is what we are trying to explore. Now, to explore this, we will use a, a metaphor, first of all. I mean, there are these two terms that we want to at least understand to some degree. One is called the implicit order and the other is called explicit order. And we'll see that these terms, while they appear uh, alien right now, they have been in the all kinds of literatures for us and all around us all the time, okay? So I'm going to play this to one minute video um, and just give me a minute and see if I can bring up this. Okay, so just, let me just give, I just stop uh, sharing for a moment and I'm going to start this so that um, I can start it with the right kind of parameters so that at least it comes uh, not uh, okay this is order okay now i've got the video and i'm okay now i'm going to sh start sharing again all right stop sharing share sound Okay, now what you need to tell me is that the sound is not too loud. Okay. Um, all right, I'll, I'll start. So this is um, an experiment where, as you can see, uh, there are two concentric jars here. And what they have is glycerin in between. And they are going to put some ink drops there and they will uh, move this handle on the currently, which is on the right hand side clockwise few times. And 
four times and then anti clockwise four times okay and this is about 1 minute 30 seconds <laughs> This is where this particular aspect of this experiment is not so surprising. I mean, we when we dissolve any particular ink or sugar or you know other things, it vanishes, right? So here the I mean, of course, there's a faint color we see as a mixed color, but mostly if you probably make a few more uh, rotations, we can imagine that it almost becomes invisible, right? Okay, now they will reverse the order of the rotation. First rotation. see that this part if you have not seen this so far or not read it would definitely appear surprising because once you dissolve something let's say sugar in water you just don't reverse the direction of your stirring and don't get sugar crystals back and this while this particular thing has a scientific explanation about how viscous the liquid is as far as we are concerned, we are trying to use this as a metaphor to represent two different orders. One is an implicit order and the other is explicit order. Okay, so let me just uh, stop sharing this and go back to uh, sharing the slides. So this particular ex experiment um, demonstrates what is called implicit and explicit order. The three ink drops, then after four rotations, get completely enfolded. If you ask the question, after four rotations, where is the blue uh, drop? And you would say it's everywhere in the liquid. Where is the yellow drop? And it would be everywhere. So implicit order represents first of all invisible order about its order about what order about the size of the drop color their relative positions all that that seems to be retained while we don't see it and but when you rotate it back it is explicit again and this perhaps points to uh, what are sometimes also called the formless and unmanifest order. So everything we see. So let, let's see one more example, which is the seed and the tree. Right? If you look at the information about the tree nest, it seems to be present in the seed and seed. And as the seed slowly becomes um, a tree, right? Um, how it's going to look the shape of the leaves, the kind of fruits it will have and the branches and all this information seems to be present implicitly in the seed itself. And as it comes out, it sort of becomes explicit. So there are these two forms in which things exist. 
what we see seems to be predominantly what is explicit and one of the bias that we looked at is um, what you see is all there is so for us explicit order is what everything is about uh, what this points to is the fact that first of all well explicit order is not everything and perhaps for every explicit order there is an implicit order as well um, even when we get a phone call actually um, on the on the cell phone we could ask before it starts ringing where is the information about the call and we kind of know that yes it's everywhere it's in the form of waves around the phone which you can carry anywhere you know that right so that's again implicit and when it becomes explicit um, you get the caller id and you know sometimes photograph and all that ringtone so a form which is implicit invisible and a form which is explicit now the question that uh, is worth asking is which is primary is implicit order primary or explicit order primary and there are other words for implicit order that are common in a lot of uh, scriptures and and literature one is formless and forms and unmanifest and manifest so when for example we think about something that's also thought form um and what this is saying is perhaps thoughts exist in a formless form right implicit in some sense and it becomes explicit now let's pause here and let's ask ashwin ashwin yeah could you know implicit formless unmanifest be more fundamental or primary that's question number 1 but if so how could one where could one begin to even explore it what, what would you say i'm hearing for the first time or i know i'm not even sure this whole thing is uh, has any meaning where would you suggest somebody can explore this Sure, sure. And I also saw an interesting question from Abhijit that why even question whether this is primary or not. So we can take the take this up later. Uh, but uh, yeah, coming back to you, when I, I mean, there are two questions, right? The first, whether this is primary or not. So I would like to supplement what you said with another example or metaphor, which all probably nineteen of us in the call have experienced or are going to experience tonight. this is about our minds taking form you know of of a deep dream so let's assume that tonight you sleep when i and you find yourself in a dream in the university of buffalo uh, you know uh, uh, just discussing with a professor about your research now in this mind has contracted itself to a particular scenario a particular place wherein you are seeing yourself in uh, us in the university right and in the moment of the dream what is explicit right the explicit is the scenario of the dream you are pretty much present there and that's what happens right our our body experiences the emotions we pretty much feel as if we are right there but the question is what is implicit implicit is our mind which has taken the the shape or form it has literally contracted itself to to show us a particular scenario right so here i mean if we ask what is more primary obviously everyone is going to say mind because if there's no mind there's no dream uh, so yeah that's that's the question number 1 um question 2 i mean first of all uh, thank you very much for writing this chapter in your book uh, the reason i'm saying is uh, you know when i've read like uh, other mindfulness book books very few books touch touches upon this implicit and explicit and i'm not sure if i'll be able to answer the uh, you know the second question really well but i'll make an attempt now uh, talking about our waking lives when we look at how are we experiencing this life so there is there are thoughts there are feelings there are sensations 
right? And if we deduce this, uh, what exactly happens? Uh, thoughts is, is nothing but thinking, right? Out of thinking comes, uh, the process is thinking and then sen uh, sensations are basically sensing. That's how we are experiencing it. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, feeling, we are feeling it, right? At the end of the day, if we are looking at this and um, my experience has been that, what is the field in which all of this appears? Thought in itself, if if it is, uh, you know, um, if it has to be experienced, there is there has to be a knowing or awareness of that thought. Like as we say, I am angry, I am sad, I am happy. Uh, you know, this I am is basically aware of what he or she is going through. So, so that that could be a good point of exploration in terms of you know, what is this field of awareness in which everything is appearing? Yeah. Okay, I think yeah that you're saying uh, if one is able to watch thoughts, right? Then where is that happening? Is that the question you're asking? Yes, uh, I mean, in general, we are aware of our thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions, right? But uh, for most of us, uh, and in fact, all of us, we are mostly consumed by these uh, so-called objects. The explicit. Right, explicit. L like in the dream metaphor, uh, like <clears throat> mind is observing the dream and in dream, everything is object, like University yeah. of Buffalo was an object. You yourself as a 28 year old winner was an object, right? But, but the mind was observing it. So it, it, you know, if you relate the same thing here, the subject is the field of knowing or awareness, which is aware of the thought, sensation, perception, feeling, emotion. Yeah. yeah. So, so can we be aware of the awareness is, is what I'm proposing. Yeah. Sure, okay. So that, that could be one place uh, where one could start. Yeah. Ashwit, now, now that uh, you know, you're here, it's also an opportunity to ask you this question about your journey itself. And we'll, and we'll come back to um, this implicit and explicit um, orders. Is that what triggered you to really um, explore this? Um, you know, you sort of did nothing else last two years and you've been in several retreats and so what was the trigger for this seeking, if we can call that? Um, and secondly, you're also saying um, that your seeking has subsided, at least that's what, uh, you know, is that correct if I say, you know, you said that? Yeah. So maybe, why would you say that now? Can you tell us that? Sure, sure. So <laughs> why did it start? It, uh, it all started uh, in 2013 or 14, uh, wherein it started with an existential void. Uh, everything was fine in life, but there was something missing. That's what I felt. And uh, so it, uh, because of the scientific bent of mind, you know, I started exploring you know, the neurotransmitters, you know, the mental health side of things, endocrine system, and it took me on and on. And then when I did my research, started playing around with EEG devices, looking at, you know, different uh, with brain waves and things like that, it it led me to uh, yoga, right? And uh, then I started looking at the connections between yoga and uh, you know the so the so called uh, you know endocrine systems and and the glands, and somehow yoga took me to a journey wherein I started exploring and questioning that uh, you know exactly the visyati uh, bias which you have been calling right. What we see is all there is, or there's something more. So by that time, um, the kind of journey, uh, the so-called journey kind of intensified and I went to Rishikesh, stayed in an ashram, started learning yoga, uh, you know, understanding a few other concepts. And then, yeah, it kind of took me to different dimensions, but there was one problem, like there was always this urge of self-improvement, right? So, so if I had anger problem, there, there was always this that, okay, mindfulness or, or yoga or meditation could help me get rid of it. So there was the seeking. And then, uh, yeah, it continued for some time. Sometime I was very busy with my startup, but in 2019, uh, it kind of, uh, it became the primary thing because I felt like a scientist, if I don't experiment in my own lab and experience, it's not gonna go anywhere. 
So that prompted me to go deeper. Then I uh, did Vipassana, also spent time with a couple of teachers like Eckhart Tolle, uh, Rupert Spira, and, uh, you know, Sal, Salvador. And uh, it was all about going deeper. And then what I did was experimenting, which is, uh, you know, going to some places and then looking, you know, taking some hypothesis and experiencing in my own uh, kind of experience and playing around with things. But as you rightly said, I mean, uh, yeah, after some time, like beyond uh, the experiments, what I realized is, what am I really seeking? You know, what am I seeking? Uh, th those questions were coming again and again. And what, uh, you know, there was one, uh, you know, breakthrough which, which came to me that if I were to seek something, like if I want to seek this mouse, I can reach out to it and hold it. But if, you know, if you ask me that, uh, can you seek yourself? Can you, you know, just stand up and take a step towards yourself? Uh, it made me clear that seeking itself is the hurdle, you know. And when I, when I, when I like, clearly saw it, uh, it, it was quite relieving. And that's how the seeking is subsided. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So that was a nice journey, I'm sure. <laughs> with its ups and downs. So, uh, okay, let's, uh, Ashwin, let's go back and, and, and revisit this um, the topic that we were saying. So I'm going to again share uh, the screen again. I guess the question that Abhijit asked is to why should we even ask this question, which is more fundamental or more primary, right? In this in this particular case that we saw, right, this um, this glycerin case, um, we know that the glycerin, the drops were never apart from the glycerin, right? They are of course there, and that's primary, really. Now, implicit order, if it is primary, then to say that I will change explicit order um, and uh, things would change uh, would, would be a mistaken thing, right? Because if all the order, all the program, everything is really in the implicit order, then it will come back again to the explicit order as, as it moves around. So if this is what is constantly going on and if implicit order is indeed primary, then um, trying to change the explicit order is like putting medicine on the mirror. That's, that's what we are proposing. And that's the reason it may be worthwhile exploring could implicit order be primary? And maybe we are wrong. Maybe there's nothing like implicit order, right? Um, so if implicit order is primary, when does implicit order change actually? And this is something we have already experienced and discussed in the webinars. And that is when we have an insight. That is when we see this nickel cube we saw um, and you see it, let's say like B and suddenly when you start seeing it like C, that's a very, very simple, but it's still a shift of perception, which is um, a simple example of what is insight. And that is, changing the implicit order, okay? Um, just to take this a little further, this is um, more than 100 years old, similar type of uh, bistable optical illusion. Is it a duck or a rabbit, right? It was uh, originally designed by a German and then it was championed and uh, publicized by an American psychologist. So is it a duck or you can see that, you know, sometimes you can see it as duck or you can see it as rabbit. I know this is what can happen. This is a nice uh, cartoon, which is based on the duck. Um, so there, there are these two armies ready to fight and they're saying, okay, there can be no peace until they renounce their rabbit God and accept our duck God. And this is, uh, I think a good example of what happens when we take the explicit order as we see uh, to be the only truth and 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 in fact we stop seeing what the others and in this specific case you know we have seen that yes it is the same thing but i i just stop seeing the other way around now what we are proposing is that implicit order is largely unknown 
and ultimately unknowable. Now, this may appear to be again a very strong statement, uh, but you know, if you just go and look at uh, what brain is, is about, it, it gets no light. This is what Vivek uh, told us a couple of sessions back that our brain has no access to light, no access to sound, touch. All it gets is electrical signals and chemical um, reactions. And from that, it is, it is creating this um, very fantastic, uh, what I should call dream world, right? Fantasy world, which is what we are seeing. And that's, this, that's how they say, your red is different from my red, right? Because I have, um, my brain is representing red in one way and yours are differently. But implicit order, which is what uh, is being represented is largely unknown. Maybe some principles get known. Mathematician like Abhijit would uh, discover some principle. You know, scientists would discover, but it's largely unknown and ultimately unknowable. What is known is its explicit expression like a ripple in the ocean. Okay, this is a proposal. Now this is, we are uh, connecting it back to Anthony. So Anthony drinks because there is a program in the implicit order which says when self image is damaged, drink for pain relief, right? Our man has this habit of getting into fights. He's trying to maybe prove himself with a bulky guy. And then when he's, he gets beaten, um, his self image is damaged. And this is something we saw in the last session as well, that when self image is damaged, there's a pain. And if you can't sustain the pain, you'll immediately try to relieve it. That's a reflex. And one of the reflex could be, well, drinking that relieves the pain. Yeah. So um, who is the real hero? So we, this book has this subtitle, right? Which is connecting with the real you. And in some sense, this chapter is, is asking that question, the real hero, who is the real hero? So the real hero as a proposal is, is the unknown and unknowable ocean of meaning carrying the implicit order. Yeah, I mean, that is, that's just a proposal. And who is, who is a proverbial villain in the story? And uh, one suggestion is that it is the illusion of control. Right. I mean, when I, when I'm, I plan to do something, I plan to write a book and, you know, after a few years, the book gets published. Not only that, when I offer a webinar, a few people come in for the webinar and people I have no clue about like Jonathan, right? I didn't know. And he's there. Right. So it's quite tempting, by the way, it's, it's really, really tempting um, to feel that actually I have achieved it's quite tempting. And then there are people who tell uh, around you that, oh, actually, you know, you're doing very well, you did. So uh, the world around me and the signals can create a very strong impression that I'm able to actually control things. I can, I can plan out, I can improve myself and so on. And uh, we are proposing that perhaps that's missing something fundamental. So Ashwin, a question to you would be, how did you begin to see through this illusion of control in, in your case? What kind of uh, things would you point to? Uh, so, so, sorry, Vinay, I just lost you for a second. Did you ask a question? Yeah, no, so we are, we are talking about illusion of control. Mm -hmm. Okay, possibility, right? I mean, and the question to you is, how did you begin to see through the illusion of control? Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, it's very difficult to put this in words because, uh, like in, in my case, what really happened is there were series of experiments or steps which happened. It came in the form of books or, or, or information or meeting someone or looking into my own experience, right? But uh, if I were to put across, uh, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm going back to the dream metaphor and from there I'll, I'll derive. Uh, a lot of people want to know, uh, you know, that while dreaming, can they know who they are, which is called lucid dreaming. Right? 
and in netflix there is a very important a very interesting um, you know documentary called mind explained or illuminated something like that and in which uh, one of the dream expert uh, says that if you want to know your dreams drink three glass of water water you know and sleep so what's going to happen is you're going to get up to uh, to go to the bathroom and 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 uh, you know in in that uh, point of time you're going to wake up and see that oh okay so this is i was dreaming right so uh, yeah that that's a good uh, you know metaphor to look at uh, for example while we are living our lives normally we are aware of our thoughts and sensations em emotions perceptions at the same time can we also give the awareness to sort of the field in which it is it is you know kind of appearing so that that's a good way to start also in our own experience when we do things for example as simple as what what i'm going to eat for the breakfast right or, or i'm going to order food or go to a restaurant or i'm going to cook it if we see in our own experience how this decision making happens right uh, we we'll, we'll see so this is just a proposal right i'm not uh, we're not saying that this is how it is but i think each one of us can try this out uh, that any significant so this is one example or any significant life so called life event like uh, like marriage or choosing a partner if we go back and see one incident after the other after the other was it a random act or it was you know well planned and decided by us that okay i'm going to marry this person or you know uh, you know do a partnership with this particular person so so that that's a good way looking looking it through yeah, yeah. Yeah, very nice. Actually, that those are uh, that's a that's a very good way to look at it. Some of the important decisions that you take, marriage could be one, yeah. job could be another, yeah, which city to live could be third, and and so on. And one could see that actually there would be a number of chance events which would have really uh, been the process. Yes. Another aspect that uh, we discuss in the book is called non-events, which is awareness of non-events, which means. when something happens when I, i mean one example that i take um, is that of cycling you know i i've not been cycling much uh, but uh, i i cycle on and off and i wear helmet but if you see in the roads um, where we cycle uh, there are cars and trucks uh, going by from the side and when i return uh, after a ride let's say an hour or two late later i could say that i am a safe rider actually i've been riding cycle for 20 years but we know that actually any moment anybody could have pushed me and and this helmet would have been of very little use so to take credit for something like this actually appears quite flimsy right and these are sometimes called at least daniel kahneman refers to them as non events which means they could have easily happened and they didn't happen that's why i perhaps i'm sitting here and even when i go from one room to another there is always a perhaps small but probability that i could slip over right and we know that these are events which have happened to our friends or family members somebody just slips and that can uh, damage something so these are non events which uh, we are not aware of every moment there are so many possibilities which can happen and i lose track and i said no no you know what i decided to do something and it made happen and you know uh, that's how i should take credit for it so so that is one uh, angle of it ashwin anything you want to add before we open up yeah sure i mean uh, there's a great book by a neuroscientist called sam harris uh, and he has written a book called free will okay uh, it's a great example in which he has collated different uh, you know examples including some very sensitive ones you know if okay. we say that we don't have control then criminals have no control on doing yeah. crimes right i mean these are very controversial and he has taken it uh, you know head on okay. and i would recommend everyone uh, to do this and yeah and uh, one more thing i mean uh, if, before we open up i think this is very uh, you know very against Uh, the kind of cultural uh, upbringing we all get right so while we experiment this hypothesis we should also be aware that there are a lot of biases which are already at play yeah so we need to be aware of it sure thanks ashwin so guys uh, let's uh, have some conversation together what are your thoughts what are your
So Abhijit, you, you are the one who is, who is asking a number of questions. He's, uh, he's a professor in um, <laughs> City University of New York. Uh, you know, topology, Abhijit, where are you? <laughs> I, I'm here. Yeah, thank okay. You, yes. Uh, uh, and again, thank you for the nice discussion, uh, both you and Ashwin. Uh, I have a, one question. Is the determination of explicit or implicit order relative to the observer? Or is it an absolute determination? Um, okay. So we are really saying um, information that exists around us, right? When, when we took the example of the seed and the tree, for example, right? a single cell which reorganizes itself, or let's say the seed organizes all the ingredients, water and the nutrients from the soil and the sunlight. And it takes the energy and reorganizes all these uh, things into what takes shape to be a tree. Um, so this, this is an information present um, and that seed seems to again come out from all parts of the, the tree. Any, anywhere there's a fruit, there's that information. In fact, sometimes you don't even need a seed to seed. Uh, you don't even need a seed to make another tree from um, a tree. So that seems to be really present everywhere. So it looks to me like an, a principle that maybe this information, large information is in implicit invisible to us and maybe uh, at a surface level there's a ripple on the of the ocean uh, which is what really we see um, in the explicit order so it, it to me it looks like something which is universal but abhijit i'm i'm just open you know this well uh, the reason i asked is because we were talking about a dream example okay and when we are in the dream it looks like everything is implicit, uh, explicit. When in we the are dream, awake, it looks like everything is explicit. And when we wake up and yeah. think about our dream, we realize yeah. that, oh, well, it's actually something else was driving it. Yeah. yeah. So there is an observer which actually determines something and the, the, it changes okay. from dreaming to waking up. And that yeah. is what my question was. I mean, you're giving an example of a seed, but again, all of this is happening for someone. And then suppose this thing was, I was dreaming about the seed. Yeah. When I wake up, I realize that the, the seed, the tree, and the person who was determining it, all of this was actually part of an implicit, explicit order. Yeah. That is what the question was about. Yeah. So I guess it, uh, to me, let me just see if this helps here, is that uh, we started with Anthony's thought of wanting to have a drink, let's say. And what we are suggesting is that the impulse or the tendency to really go have this particular drink or take an action, right? That thought programmatically sits somewhere deep down in the ocean of this implicit order, right? I have no clue. It's not accessible where it is. And under some, some circumstances, it pops up. Perhaps we are just hypothesizing that yes, under this uh, situation where his self-image is perceived to be damaged, um, he, see, he wants to restore it and, and that's where the thought pops up, right? So it's a form which comes up in the explicit form, but somewhere it was buried deeply somewhere. Right? And we are not even sure if one can say it was, that ocean was like an individual ocean and it's a, it's a shared, you know, shared ocean. Right. So, um, so it, sure. it sounds like what you're saying is about uh, subtler forms, growth subtler forms. forms. So, yeah. So mm. it's definitely and so, the sub yeah, it's the, subtler yeah. it is, the more powerful it is. And if you can change subtler things, it will the the gross things or the more explicit things. That's correct. Be. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So in that sense, it's not binary. Uh, you know, subtler and gross. Right. It's yeah. uh, more continuous than. Okay. Than what yeah. here. Thank you. Thanks for uh, asking. But uh, uh, Vinay, can I? <clears throat> yeah, can yeah, I Anjali, please. Yeah, yeah. I feel uh, that the observer that uh, Abhijit is speaking about 
is present in the explicit order and not in the implicit order okay anjali can you elaborate a little bit as to uh, why you feel that way uh, i mean the the statement that uh, what you see is what is there yeah yeah is my observation of whatever is there okay it's not necessarily what what is really there okay yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's like my red is different from your red that's right yeah okay yeah yeah but the red as such is the implicit order the 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 real red whatever that may be yeah, yeah. the the pigment yeah is the implicit order of that matter but okay. what i perceive okay is through myself okay and okay. because there is a self there is a explicit order okay so you are saying so you there's so many filters through which this observation happens you are saying yeah and that filter is what you are really saying is the self so i i would go go a step further and say that the invisible program sitting in anthony gonzalez's mind yeah is probably not an implicit order it's not an implicit it's also order. an explicit order specific to his prejudices yeah. okay this is a hypothesis i haven't fully read it in detail i'm sorry to yeah, yeah. say things without uh, really having enough basis Yeah, but no, this is what came to my mind. So yeah, I it's, yeah, see, it's it's possible, Anjali. I mean, uh, neuroscientists have not really figured out the storage of memory in in the uh, brain yet. I think they can, they cannot pinpoint locations in the brain where certain memories reside. Like they can't say I can change something. And so, how exactly the storage happens of beliefs um, is still um, an unknown. And 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 but you. you never know i mean you know it, it could somebody may in future find and out and also i mean if you talk about drinking specifically let's say if we explore that then there is also an established fact of a genetic uh, yes, but when it is relative to something that he is feeling or thinking then that is the explicit form of something implicit is implicit but probably Anyway, I'm confused. I think let me stop. No problem. <laughs> And let's yeah. go ahead. Yeah. 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 No. So gene, genetic information is a form of, uh, you know, implicit uh, storage. Implicit, uh, right. Storage. But not everything that uh, drives that action, I would yeah. say. And But what I mean, uh, with this discussion with Abhijit, what we are also saying that there could be perhaps even subtler forms than that as well. I mean, right now our limitations could be up to the gene level. but the, the forms could go subtler than that and you know so it's a continuous um, from subtler to gross kind of dynamic yeah but so if if there is no self then the explicit will vanish right what will remain will be implicit or explicit will be just i mean if you go back to glycerin the same as the implicit yeah it's the same meaning glycerin and ink drop if you take i mean it was never separate right i mean waves are never separate the yellow blue and red drops were never separate from the glycerin um, just that yes. they they just take the forms and and you see but you don't That's see right. the glycerin yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah please yeah. go ahead <laughs> all right thank you thanks anjali for uh, observation yeah any anybody else yeah now yeah, i have uh, one uh, question or uh, yeah, clarification yeah. nagesh please yes uh, Nag nagesh yeah yeah uh, you know uh, i think you know uh, implicit and explicit the way i understand is so you, all that we sense through the five senses we have is explicit yeah and like you know a seed seed is the implicit form of uh, a tree a big tree see at the end of a seed uh, you know uh, becomes a big tree so seed is the implicit form of a, a, a tree you call it as so uh, see in uh, uh, maybe i'll refer to that mandukya upanishad in the mandukya upanishad uh, what happened they talk about three different phases like you know one is wake waking waking stage that is you are you, you are able to see the world through your five senses and another state is uh, a dreaming state okay So one is the waking state, another is a dreaming state, another is a deep sleep. 
so in the deep sleep you don't you are going you are not going to have any dream or you are not awake but when you get up you know that uh, you, know, you had a deep sleep where you nothing happened actually i mean you are you are slept well but you are aware that there is a something called deep sleep was there so in all these three uh, different phases of uh, this there is something called consciousness and uh, that consciousness is something which is the witness for all these different phases and i mean i'm just trying to when you said implicit and explicit so i was just thinking of that mandukya upanishad where all these things are explained yeah. so that consciousness is some uh, yeah i don't know how to relate to it but i thought i share it with yeah thanks uh, nagesh uh, what we are saying is is quite uh, similar in that sense that implicit order um, is what uh, would be called as formless or unmanifest um, in in upanishads yes thanks nagesh um hi vinay swati yeah, sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this chapter uh, as you have written like you know it's been a difficult chapter yeah. and uh, some of the statements like you know the self improvement is a meaningless act and uh, as you have said that you know it it could shock you and you know so that precisely that is what happened with me so i have a question now uh, with uh, this like you know if this is a statement self improvement is a meaningless act and also we are talking about an illusion of control so i feel uh, like you know these are the two things that result in action so if we go by these hypotheses of the illusion of control and you know the uh, self improvement is meaningless won't it result in inaction or i mean i'm it's difficult for me to understand the way yeah um, so action seems to be um, an expression of that implicit order whatever your perception is so one of the you know sentences which uh, really uh, struck me was a uh, perception is action and and that's not just i mean it's also um, you know it, one can attribute it to someone like did the krishna murti but one can act also attribute to a neuroscientist carl friston who is one of the most uh, you know you know is a leading um, computational neuroscientist so um, whatever you perceive um, that perception gets activated in the implicit order and its expression is the action right so that's one way to to look at it in the sense the meaning that is at every moment whatever the meaning that is perceived now um, that action happens if you misperceive the world just like it happened in the case of anthony and and we are saying self deception and we looked at various other illusions where uh, reality is misperceived the action will be you can say conflict ridden or confusing because that's the expression of that perception and when the perception has some clarity um the action would be accordingly so another form in which it stated is clarity is action it's almost like a mathematical statement that clarity is action which means at that moment whatever um, gets perceived if if it has clarity then the action would have accordingly some clarity but what it it could also mean um sometimes inaction also but i mean inaction could also be um part of our anyway different expression so sometimes when um for example in the case of fighting right i mean we saw these two guys uh, the rabbit god and uh, this duck god guys fighting it's also possible that one could see some fights as meaningless and one could not enter them as well right so that's also a possible act but in general it's not uh, uh, it's not it doesn't imply that once there is beginning to see these things it automatically means in action in that sense uh, what does it uh, make sense uh, all or... yeah so you're saying that whatever the action or the inaction that doesn't matter yes as long as yeah okay yeah it anyway action is going to be just an expression of whatever is 
perceived at all you know perceived any way whatever that meaning is that meaning is expressed that information is just like the the seed is expressing itself and you know its natural action is to grow at some point but after the tree has grown uh, the action is to just sustain the size it's not that the tree keeps growing forever so the action of the information uh, beyond a certain point the cells would know that okay this is enough the form is this is the right form for the tree and now the idea is to just sustain this so i guess that even a tree would have a different set of actions um, based on uh, the context yeah yeah thanks for that yeah thanks for uh vina can can you hear me yes jonathan yes okay i've been having trouble with the sound part of my apparatus um i uh let me see i just want to say that i feel like every week i tune into this i am just hurled into the deep end of the pool and my mind just uh swirls uh endlessly like i'm in the ocean with all the ideas uh, that are being discussed. Uh, and I get so nervous when I wanna say something because I feel like I won't say anything that's coherent. Um, with, with all this uh, explicit and implicit stuff, um, you know, that's a, sort of a dichotomy. It's a dualistic way of, of looking at things. And, and um, I've found wonderful, um, you know, solace in being able to back up and say, okay, let's look at the two sides of something. But at some point, it's like the implicit informs the explicit and the explicit informs the, uh, you know, they go, they chase each other's tails in some way. Um, um, but what's really clear to me is that the closer I look at anything, uh, it always changes, no matter what it is. The closer I look at it, I think I know what it is. And then I say, holy shamolies, I don't know what this is. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's true of looking at something on a smaller and smaller scale or on a bigger and bigger scale. And so what's just really clear to me is that my limited brain is trying to understand something that's unlimited. And, uh, you know, therein lies the nut that just, you can never crack. Yeah. It just keeps chasing its tail. Yeah. And so, but, uh, uh, you know, I do think that we humans are meaning making machines and that we don't have any choice over that. And uh, it seems like a curse in some ways because you're always trying to make meaning out of something. Um, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> you know, one way to look at it is that, oh, when you're trying to make meaning, you're trying to understand the wholeness of something. You're trying to integrate it into a story that makes sense. But the problem is that I'm a limited, I'm just a, a, a little piece of everything. And so it just, it humble, it, when I have the presence of mind to say what's really going on here, it humbles me every once in a while when I let it in to uh, say, oh, I've just got a piece of this. And so I need to, to sort of talk with somebody else about this. Uh, and then it's that process of knitting together what my uh, understanding is with somebody else's understanding. And I've just been amazed at how I can get to some place in a completely different way that somebody else got there. Yep. And yet through dialogue, you know, somehow you, you come to this place of uh, saying, holy cow, that's, uh, uh, there's, there's wholeness. And, but it changes. So it's just like this thing where the automatic uh, fast responses, uh, you know, uh, you just have to step back from them 
and um, and have faith that um, consciousness is this enormous thing that we are all just a little piece of. Yeah. Wonderful observation, Jonathan. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah. I guess one could look at it that somewhere if there is an acceptance that a map can never really uh, understand unlimited territory. It's always a map. <laughs> then one, yeah. one, you know, it's of course useful to have maps and maps are always useful. They're changing, updating, but it's always a map. Yeah, it's like uh, territory. you're sunk with a map, but uh, I mean, even if you have a map, you know, you know, it's just a map. Just a map, just a map. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Ashwin, any, any, uh, uh, Thing, any points before we close uh, from your side? Uh, well, I will, uh, nothing. I think it, it was a great discussion. Uh, I'll just leave, uh, you know, everyone with, with with a point or a hypothesis to to also consider along with a lot which has to be considered after this session. Uh, let's say if this implicit is infinite, right, and explicit is finite. So, is it really possible for finite to know infinite? Right. right and 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 if like you could you could experiment in your own lab uh, of of experience and and just just find out yeah so we are not really saying there's an answer yeah great thanks ashwin and thanks for joining us and thanks everybody uh, for joining yeah it was wonderful to have you all and hope to see you uh, next saturday um, at the same time yeah uh, for the last session thank you everybody thank you all right Thanks. Bye. Bye.